Plato's Darius franchise, introduced into the arcades back in 86, this quote-unquote shmup saga centers around the ongoing war between the forces of King Belser, or according to some sources, Belsar, made up of numerous attack crafts named after medicines, no less, and giant mechanical renditions of aquatic life, which of course we'll see a lot of in later follow-ups and spin-offs, and our main heroic pilots of the Silverhawk 3F1B crafts sanctioned by the Galactic Federation, Proko Jr. and Tiat Young, whose first names are taken from the game's rival developer, by the way, obviously Taito Corporation. Now, the way that this game and its sequel were designed, developed, and presented was a mind-blowing one, thanks to the combined efforts of Junji Arita, along with Akira Fujita and Toru Sugawara, the planner and programmer individually. There were three monitors, utilized in order to format and fit this insanely gargantuan-as-fuck cinematic view we're all feasting our eyes on at this very moment. Complete with sets of mirrors to make these three screens appear fused with each other while the center faced forward and the outer two were pointed up, thereby making them stand out amongst all the rest. Anyways, all technical capabilities aside, in this lineup's case, the first of which we're looking at will be starting with Sagaya, aka Darius 2 for the Genesis, circa 1990-91. Of course, you have to excuse the third-rate label condition. In fact, this was what it was supposed to look like originally. But enough rambling, let's just fire up this bitch! I know we're close to the end of the year, but my gentle Jesus do we have a lot to get to. Before anything else, however, I'm dedicating this review to Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, as per usual. Boston Open Screen, We're at Local Productions, Triple Yet Productions, The Stones, Matt and Sarah, Matt Lister and Ian Bergeson from Ringe, Dover, and Merrimack, New Hampshire, individually. One Coin Only, Headlocked Gaming, Voxney, Old School Gamer Mama, Black Retro Gamer, Current Boston Mayor Michelle Wu, Kenzie Bach, District 8 City Councilor, Michael Dennis from Cathead Pictures, James Rowe from Cine Massacre, Chris Boris from Y2B Productions, Studio Mud Prince, High Energy Vintage, Replayed, Sudden Impact, Land of Electronics, Game Zone, Bit Bar Salem, Troll 2, The Band, now made up of O'Grady, DePaz, and Fitzgerald, Lauren Pespisa and Rod Weber of Dumpster Fire 2020 fame, Jules Carosa from Gen Y Films and Goliath Post, Darman Studios, Jay Shetty, Vid Chronicles, Samir Bafnani, Life Lessons with Lewis, Super Mission, Illumiably, ETU Animated Stories, Expect the Unexpected, Sharing My Secret, My Story Animated, Nerd Caliber, The Mount Vernon Kid, Chava Slovakia, Tim from Timothy Reacts, Ashley Burton, aka Awkward Ashley, Popcorn in Bed, Melverse, Leo, aka Mr. Video, Alana Parker, Yvette Wilkes, Shigeru Miyamoto and Reggie Fizame from Nintendo, Koji Garashi, Keiji Inafune, Shinya Arino, Bella, aka Girl with Yellow Spoon, Kayla Atino, aka Plum Drop 11, or Plummy, K Volta, Justin Maloney, aka J Bone, and finally, I cannot believe this shit, if they are watching this, Andrew Lowry of DIY fame, and also Scopal Matt on Twitch if you haven't done so already, and Austin Rutledge from Northampton. With those out of the way, onto this game's main premise. Continuing from where the previous Darius installment left off, King Belser's empire has managed to resurface themselves, primarily to conquer and annihilate the entire fucking solar system and every surrounding planet within it, as they did with the faraway titular planet. Now, upon receiving an SOS signal, the always defiant Silverhawks, helmed by the very same Proko Jr. and T-At Young, rush to every destructive scene to not only put those devious dildos in their goddamn place, but to set everything right throughout the universe, and most importantly, to avenge the already ravaged Darius itself. Regarding the gameplay, well, it's like every other shmup in history, hence what I've covered and what we've all seen so far many a time before now. This and its next two offerings play out quite differently. The Silverhawk craft you control depends on who you selected from the get-go in the options area. For instance, Proko Jr. for his Red Silverhawk and Siat Young for her Blue Silverhawk, except the latter starts off with a single power level increase on every available weapon, but both control about the same way. 
after pretty much navigating and quote unquote hovering ass throughout every planet and making every opposing attack craft under Belzar's command your forever bitches left and right, while obtaining the following power gems for your Silverhawk craft from dispatch rows of enemy crafts, red for its main horizontal laser cannon, and especially its vertical and or diagonal green beams, green for its diagonal downward and later upward bombs, similar to the Hawkwind, aka the two-way missiles in Gradius 2 and onward, and blue for its temporary force field to withstand damage, minor or major, which vanishes upon absorbing too much, akin to the earlier cited Gradius, that is, unless more can be acquired. New to this installment here are the Energy Core, which not only obliterates the ever-loving fuck out of every on-screen adversary upon landing shots at it, hence of course your basic screen nuke, but also makes every boss confrontation a goddamn cakewalk, and the small and large rainbow orbs, which enhance the laser, bomb, and missile power levels by 1 and 2 individually, rare as they are. Control-wise, the D-pad guides the Silverhawk crafts anywhere, again like most shmups, and the maintenance surrounding lasers are deployed via A and C, while the downward and or upward bombs are deployed via B, complete with either an auto or manual mode to boot, preset in the options area as well. Bear in mind that your main Silverhawk craft will end up reverting back to fuck all, power level-wise, upon getting obliterated to shit by any opposing adversary, projectile, or unexpected environmental collision, like in every other goddamn shmup, obvi. Another quirk to bear in mind, there's even a level branching system in which one of multiple alternate paths can be selected upon clearing not just the first area, but every other area thereafter, akin to Sega's Outrun, Trico and UPL's Atomic Robo Kid, and especially Konami's Castlevania 3, YY World 2, and Contra Hardcore. Though you're only allowed to take on 7 varying missions at a time, in this game's case, there's 28 in total, thereby not only unlocking multiple endings, but also enhancing the hell out of the replayability like a lifetime supply of Red Bull, and expect the same mechanic to return in the later offerings. Did I forget to mention there's no simultaneous 2-player mode here, and in Supernova, unlike in Darius Twin, which I intend to discuss as well? Anyhow, concerning the overall operation itinerary here, you start off on the Sun, hence Zone A, with an endless lava pit to boot, featuring the return of King Fossil, the first boss from the original Darius, followed by the lionfish-like Hyper Sting, Mercury, hence Zones B and or C, a mechanical fortress or cave, individually, featuring the seahorse-like Green Coronatus, followed by Alloy Lantern, modeled after an Atlantic football fish, Venus, Zones D, E, or F, a volcanic terrain, void of space, or planetary base, featuring the piranha-like Fatty Glutton, another boss returning from the original Darius, and the massive, more AEL-inspired Driosom. The moon, broken up into zones G, H, I, or J, the lunar cave, its lunar base, its planetary surface, or another space void outside said planet, featuring that shithead squid Cuttlefish, followed by a porcupine fish-like creature, Steel Spine. The Earth, hence our own planet, made up of zones K, L, M, N, and O, and in no particular order, the ocean surface, urban landscapes, the North Pole, or an underwater passage, featuring a loggerhead sea turtle, Strong Shell, followed by a Mato, a hermit crab, otherwise bizarrely referred to as My Home Daddy, discovered in zones L and N, or Lede, the purple sea urchin, discovered in zones K, M, and O, Mars, broken up into zones P, Q, R, S, T, and U, again in no particular order, the planet's surface, the two underground caves, one of which is made up of ice, and even its planetary canal, volcanic terrain, and interior base. Featuring the anemone-like electric fan, followed by the Grand Octopus, discovered in zones P, R, and T, or Red Crab, hence a Fiddler Crab, discovered in zones Q, S, and U. And finally, Jupiter, holy shit, an unprecedented seven paths. Zones V split up into two alternate paths, W, X, and Y, and Z also split into two alternate paths. In no particular order, whether it's some endless cloudy voids, gas voids, outer space, or its massive planetary surface, featuring an unprecedented-ass rematch parade from the returning mini-bosses in every previous area, with the most merciless and motherless of fucksticks ever to conquer the shmup universe following suits. Little Stripes, the freshwater angelfish in zones W and Y, Biostrong, a fish fetus and or embryo in zones V1 and Z1, Motherhawk, the gargantuan as fuck duplicate of your main Silverhawk attack crafts in Zones Z Dash and V Dash, and the port exclusive Neo Nogia, a skeletal horse mackerel in Zone X, or placing little stripes in the arcade parents. Seriously, if most of you think I'm blowing smoke up anyone's asses here regarding not only the constant, unexpected, and arduous paths in each area, populated by one armada of mechanical weapons, environmental disasters, and otherworldly life forms after another to reach every next governing target, but also how to stand your own ground against them. Consider yourself the fucking Christ wrong! Dead mother goddamn fucking, fucking Akira raping, armadillo castrating, cum spewing and swapping, ass gaping, sound tossing, vomit inducing, testicle shitting, tortoise teabagging, chump dropping, asylum inmate 69ing WRONG!
As I've advised with many other shooters like this, your top shelf AAA game is a definite must if you're willing to survive all the insurmountable chaos this offers and then some. For the most part, the rudimentary controls aren't anything to take for granted, given that the chances of getting your Silverhawk craft wrecked as shit are higher than the Superman roller coaster ride at Six Flags, should your overall senses happen to go south of the border and north of the Yukon all at the same time, and yours be a four-stated variety of branching paths, thereby, of course, making the gameplay procedure manageable beyond measure. So why bullshit any further about it at all, right? As courteous and engaging as Sagaya, aka Darius 2, is at first, in terms of challenge of course, I wouldn't so much as expect this fucking game to suck anyone's dick in the least, cause it doesn't pull any punches whatsoever, shit no. To paraphrase Lionheart, this game will toy with you, give you hope, and then tear ass the motherfucking hell apart! As is the case with every other shmup title and or franchise I've experienced not just through this project, but throughout my entire goddamn span of existence, there is barely any margin for fuck-ups at all. Your senses have to be undeniably dead on, especially sight, predominantly due to the ongoing patterns of every incoming adversary, diminutive and vast alike, not to mention the awesome distracting us balls projectile shots they deploy, and the obvious weak points of both the mini and main boss adversaries that govern each area. Shit, I don't even need to remind everyone once again of how redundant and tedious it is to farm your ass off should your Silverhawk craft get crushed to a flaming fuck sender. Starting out with 1 to 5 lives, available via the option screen before kicking everything off, and a fair yet finite amount of continues, specifically 5 regardless of the difficulty mode, don't get too severely crestfallen if these operations happen to trip your ass up more often than one could conjure up, which of course they will, and worse than any academic and psychiatric exam in history I might add. Either way, all metaphors aside, I'd also take advantage of the aforementioned level branching system to see how each operation evolves in between each playthrough, not to mention the immediate learning curve entailing more than just the upkeep of your Silver Hotcraft's main weapons and shield barrier, and those previously recounted enemy attack patterns and environmental hazards are also an immediate mandatory must, which also apply even if you started off with Tiat's blue Silver Hotcraft, whose weapon power level is, once again, boosted up a notch from the get-go. On the graphical forefront, just like with every early 16-bit shmup on the market from three decades ago, the varying environmental settings never cease to amaze the ever-loving shit out of us, especially the first scene, hence Zone A, on the sun, with its near-realistic background and foreground elements intermingled with each other, in addition to the solar flares and waves of flame that rise and fall as you pass by. OMG, talk about some serious Life Force and Gradius 2 and 3 vibes. Not to mention even the mechanical bases, voids of outer space, and exterior surface areas on and between every planet throughout our solar system, some of which turn out to be hit or miss. Given how dark the overall palette is, as opposed to the original arcade parents and the various ports that would eventually follow, a few notable examples include the Japan-only NEC PC Engine Super CD-ROM and the slightly inferior, if surprisingly advanced, Master System versions, with the latter being developed by Natsume for Taito, not counting any CD-exclusive ports, which very accurately resemble the original arcade to a T. The main attack crafts are out of fucking sight, displaying a sense of dynamism in every attack they dish out, and even the never-ending factions of enemies they confront very often, including, but not limited to the governing, intense boss adversaries resembling every form of aquatic life in history, which of course would be the mainstay of the franchise, and tend to appear randomly in later planetary settings, putting even the likes of the Mega Man mini-bosses to instantaneous, irreversible contempt beyond human understanding. But why even bother stopping there, right? Music and sound-wise, orchestrated by Hisayoshi Ogura, a former member of Taito's in-house band Tsutata, of Arkanoid and Ninja Warriors fame, in association with the pre-Steel Empire and Ranger X Noriyuki Iwadare, based on the original Arcade Parents soundtrack, there's no denying how bitchin' as fuck the choices of themes are, as they fit each respective situation decently, if more than that. Sure, many would end up running for the hills non-stop due to certain tracks being rather repetitive, grainy, and unoriginal. But why should I even give 350,000 shits? As immensely grating and nerve-curdling as the sound effects are, in reality, they're nothing short of diverse and sustainable for each situation, most notably when every gem item is obtained by Proko Jr. or Tiat Silverhawk crafts along the way, the endless barrage of weapons they unleash, likewise for the adversaries they confront, the alarm klaxons set off at the start of every end boss encounter, the appropriate explosions when they all get liquidated, specifically the main Silverhawk crafts and the numerous opposing adversaries, that is, not to mention when the energy core gets set the fuck off when firing at it, the instantaneous takeoff of the crash at the end of each zone, and during the opening cutscene before the title. And who could forget that operatic vocal sting upon starting the game, based on the same sting also heard in the arcade when you throw coins in the machine, I might add. And I'd listen very carefully if I were you. Also, why Tiat's opening line about tuna sashimi at the start of the first stage was removed is way beyond my ass. Either way, take note of my top 8 songs displayed below.
Concerning Sagaya, aka Darius 2's replayability, due largely to that often recounted level branching system, whose only flaws include quantity over quality, in terms of how monotonous the settings for the later planetary settings can be, not to mention how often you'll run into certain aquatic life inspired boss creatures more than once, the multiple endings depending on which final area you're destined to soldier through, and the importance of keeping all your main attack crafts buried at mandatory essentials in tow, without even so much as a dent. It's no wonder you'll come launching back for more, with another in the ongoing slew of stellar, sensational 16-bit shmups ever to grace the Genesis, right next to Thunder Force 2, 3, and 4, aka Lightning Force, Gyrez, Raiden Trath, Troubleshooter, Arrow Flash, Whip Rush, Fire Shark, Wings of War, Soul Deast, Steel Empire, Elemental Master, and the like. the other Darius offerings fair? Well, only one way to find out. No, scratch that. Make that two. Exhibits B and C respectively, Darius Twin and Supernova, the latter aka Darius Force, both of their Super NES, Circa 91 and 93 respectively. The plotline here is pretty much a retread of its two predecessors, not to mention the fact that it's been set between its respective events, in which case, refer back whenever necessary. Except a new command center is sanctioned by the Galactic Federation on Orga, a planet teeming with rare-ass resources, hence the very same planet mentioned in Darius 2 that Kroko and T had helped to give birth to, to aid in their continuous crusades against Belser's cock-teasing brigades of bastard barbarians, raising hell throughout numerous planets within the Rakia galaxy. In terms of gameplay, everything's ditto as fuck like before, except you're stuck with a single green Silverhawk attack craft in one player mode, and the returning red and blue Silverhawks, piloted once again by Proko and Tiat respectively, in two player mode, this time business as usual, blasting off and obliterating the living piss out of every incoming adversary, as expected, on a coastal planet, Relayer, and then branching out to other planets throughout Rekia, in a seven stage space slaughter fest. Since this and Supernova, again to be examined eventually, are Super NES games we're dealing with here, obviously, why and for deploying both the main lasers and surrounding bombs, or later surrounding lasers, individually in conjunction with the usual D-pad for navigating the Silverhawk or Silverhawks, while XAL and or R don't do jack shit. Regarding the special items, the pink or red gem enhances the main laser weapons, the green gem enhances the bombs and or diagonal weapons, blue summons and sustains the Silverhawks force field until it absorbs too much wear and tear from projectiles or collisions, orange awards an extra ship, yellow searches an instant screen nuke, thereby replacing the energy core, the silver case red gem heralds a special top secret weapon shift at later intervals, with the latter three turning out to be the absolute rarest. Take note that your main ship sustains all its weapon enhancements even after death, except for the force field, of course. And here's the big straight shot to the balls regarding this game. There's no continues this time around. I mean, what the fuck, Taito? And while we're at it, the planet by planet grid setup is broken into 12 areas, counting both the first and final planets, specifically the earlier announced for Lair and Darius itself individually, all with their individual separate mini boss, except for the planets Lankith, Zone D, Noemu, hence Zone J, and Horalane, hence Zone K, and main end boss confrontations as before. Who are our primary targets this time around, one might ask? On Relair, hence that very same introductory planet, two fish-like conquerors make their approach. Dark Angel, followed by Killer Hygia, Code HHO2. Throughout the voids of space, past planets Danto and Coloba, hence zones B and C. The Pente Shark, followed by Emperor Fossil and Queen Fossil, Codes EP30 and QU10 respectively. Offshoots of King Fossil, show no mercy. On planet Lankus, Zone D, only one main end boss takes no fucking prisoners. Demon Sword, code BD4Z, the Sword Tip Squid, not to be confused with that lame-ass Legend of Kage spin-off, also another work of Taito's. On planets Patty and Rear, hence zones E and F, Blowhard followed by Dual Shears SP, code 00 and 1. A Fugu Pufferfish and Crayfish, respectively, are more than an indestructible force to be fucking reckoned with. 
on planets Narukini, Sabia, and Gerudo, Zones G, H, and I, the Hermit Crab Radiator, followed by the seahorse-like Dark Coronatus, Code ZZ-10 on Zones G and I, and or the giant Pacific Octopus Red Mist, Code ASP-7 on Zone H, not to be confused with Chris D'Amico's original superhero alias and Kick-Ass, will make goddamn sure your ass won't survive long enough. On planets Noemu and Horolane, Zones J and K respectively, there are two main end bosses guaranteed to give new meanings to the two-word shitstorm, Full Metal Shell, Code MX-04, aka another one of Donatello's long-lost uncles, minus the bow staff, and the bizarrely named sperm whale of a battleship, Hyper Great Thing, Code GG-0D. And finally, on hyperspace approach towards the title planet Darius, hence Zone L, the debut of the Super Alloy Lantern, LC-40, on whom the original Alloy Lantern from the previous offering has absolutely dick all, followed by the towering walrus Great Tusk, Code FH-10. As before, compared to the always constant as the Northern Star, random as all get motherfucking out legions of Belser's latest brigade, don't expect so much as a fair shake from those unrelenting, cock-squashing, acid-pissing sons of bitches. That is, of course, unless you're fully enhanced and 100% aware of what'll come your way, thanks to the always straightforward, if in this game's case, overclocked at certain junctures, navigation-wise, control schematics and gameplay framework, over which I'm in no position whatsoever to beat a dead god fucking damn horse! Challenge-wise, while it's within approximately the same margin as Sagaya, aka Darius 2, and notwithstanding its obvious restrictions and minor slip-ups, Twins has been made out to be more of a milk run as opposed to all the others, and that certain areas turn out to be carbon copies of those from earlier offerings, with barely anything out of the ordinary, including but not limited to Zones B and C, hence the aforementioned space voids outside Danto and Coloba individually, despite the latter featuring a more gargantuan and, at times, aggressive as shit brigade of adversaries. And don't get me started with how certain stages can randomly scroll diagonally, akin to Tegnasoft's Thunder Force, particularly Planet Lankus, Zone D let alone the semi-predictable offensive patterns of nearly every boss you go up against, at least after that shit for brain sword tip squid demon sword, in which cases, always pay close motherfucking attention at all times. Either way, the same survival strategies I outlined a while ago apply both here as you start off between 1 to 8 lives, more of which can be acquired by nabbing the rare orange gems, and absolutely no continues, as I've established a while ago, and with a soon-to-be-discussed supernova, so I'd refer back to them whenever appropriate if I were you. The graphics are every bit as vibrant and diverse as before, despite not introducing any major improvements whatsoever by comparison, given how the designs of the Silverhawk Crash are the same, including the green single-player exclusive variation, and the power-level appropriate choices of weaponry they display on the galactic frontline spanning through the 12 planets. Most of the opposing legions of adversaries have changed dramatically, however, and especially the target mini- and end-stage bosses that preside every planet when you confront them, mixed with a few notable others from the previous two installments, and how can anyone ever go wrong with the varying environmental backgrounds for the select exceptional planets, not counting those near-realistic yet bland-ass space voids? In terms of music and sound, composed this time around by Kasuyuki Onui of Rastan for the Sega Master System, Superman Arcade 88, Rainbow Islands, Night Stalker and Night Stalker S fame, and Norihiro Furukawa of Super Space Invaders 90, The Ninja Kids, Space Gun, Arabian Magic, Hit the Ice on Super NES, Muscle Move 3, 4, and again, and Project X Zone fame, this game's variety of songs don't disappoint even a fucking smidgen. There's more of a bold and near-futuristic vibe to these new tracks than before, and they never get old even after god knows how long, thanks to the pre-sampled riffs, with the obvious exception of a select few, of course. I honestly wish there was more to express about the sound effects, even realizing how eerily constant and lagging they are, despite their almost realistic capabilities. Not so much the weapon firing, item procurements, and how the Silverhawk's shield aura gets dissolved upon withstanding damage. And as always, take note of my top 8 songs shown at the left. In stark contrast to Zagaya, replayability-wise, of course, there's very little to comment on at this juncture, apart from the two fluctuating difficulty curves and choices of weaponry depending on your ship's overall strategic methods. Although there are some joys to be had with this particular console-exclusive follow-up, including but not limited to the inclusion of a two-player co-op mode, in clear as day reality, they're just overshadowed and hampered by its own audiovisual and control-based imperfections, despite the few other schmups that may also end up latching onto them. Either way, and forgive any double standard mannerisms in advance, I give Darius Twin a shot or two, pun barely intended as per usual, and then move on to something else.
Whether or not this is supposed to be a direct and or indirect sequel, prequel, or spinoff is anyone's fucking guess. However, it does boast the same continuity of what we've seen so far, intermingled with some prehistoric elements, mostly in terms of how long human battles have been existing and such, starting with a gathering of bones from slain beasts by our human ancestors, or in the case of this iteration, how certain weapons have been made from wood and stone. The so-called Solar Defense War eventually plays out as intended. The Dariusites continue their tranquil, often thriving lives by establishing and pioneering other planet states while maintaining their security thanks to the never-faltering efforts of the Silverhawk attack crafts, thereby carrying out their countless necessary enhancements and mass production processes should any future invasions occur. And who'd expect anything less than this? History repeats the ever-loving shit out of itself, as there is an all-new opposing residual legion of adversaries, of which King Belzer's own legions were pawns the whole god fucking damn time for the record! Once more, gameplay-wise, isn't it all obvious by now? The same kick-ass, anything-but-dull, action-infused schmup-fest of the previous two entries is back. Except you start off with one of three different improved Silverhawk attack crafts, 229X0001, Type 1 in green, FFSA0019, Type 2 in blue, aka Tiat's usual attack craft, and FRSA6351, Type 3 in red, hence Proko Jr.'s usual attack craft, all with varying weapon enhancement patterns depending on how many red gems are nabbed, no less. While, of course, the usual Y and B for unloading the main lasers and bombs makes its comeback in terms of control, in conjunction with a customary D-pad for free-range movement and evasion, the R button allows your craft to swap between said bombs or the surrounding beams. Hell, even these are also deployed at half power, in sync with your main laser depending on what's enabled from the get-go after swapping, allowing you to prioritize your weaponry choices more often, no less. Not only do you end up losing every enhancement, which yet again, are annexed depending on how many red gems are obtained, not counting the aura shield, enabled upon acquiring the blue gems, upon getting wrecked to shit-ass scrap metal, you'll either wind up back at the beginning, or at a conveniently designated checkpoint depending on your progress, despite the routine of rebuilding your attack craft's overall weaponry power being way less of a goddamn chore this time, hopefully. Oh, and the green gems provide extra points or an extra life at random, depending on your overall scoring pattern. Shit, I don't even need to mention that there's a special laser weapon that appears at certain random intervals throughout this game's latest 15-stage space slaughter fest, which can only be used once. ONLY MOTHERFUCKING ONCE! In which case, acquire and refrain from firing while attempting to evade every incoming attack at your own risk until the time comes, and even a blue and silver screen nuke that also appears at random intervals. Our latest Explore and Destroy itinerary here features the following. Avoid a space illuminated by a red aurora, complete with an asteroid field in between, throughout which the trilobite and bubble-shielded Daphne-like biohazard rule the stars. Zones B and C, a nature-teeming wilderness landscape beneath which an underwater pathway lies, and a topsy-ass, turfy-ass maze of a mechanical fortress, respectively, throughout which the Ammonite, appearing in Zone B only, and the Portuguese man o war like Muddy Crystal, with the latter also appearing in two different hues, dwell and defend without any fears. Zones B and F, two more mechanical fortresses, both with sepia and navy blue tones individually, within which the bacteriophage virus, phage, occupies its rightful territories, followed by that cybernetic pissant spiral snail. Zone E, another wilderness landscape, except at night, featuring a spacious cave within which the Thunderbolt fans, two twin anemones, one purple and one red, don't take any shit whatsoever. Zones G and I, another void of space, this time illuminated by a blue aurora, in another wilderness landscape featuring an underwater cave, at sunset this time, within which both the Trilobite and Ammonite make their return, followed by Ichthion, aka Devilfish. Zone H, another asteroid field, within which the gargantuan, orfish-like battleship Peace Destroyer awaits, resulting in a raid reminiscent of Irem's R-Type and even the aforementioned Thunder Force, after which you're coasting through a narrow-ass corridor filled to the brink with random, diminutive alcoves where you have to end up in only one specific area, or you'll end up being total to jizz all. Zones J and L, an exterior beige tone fortress and an underwater mechanical fortress, respectively, with the former not including a mid-stage captain, whereas the latter includes the Dunkley Osteus, within which both the Jackson's Chameleon Stealther and the Elasmosaurus Xanic II conquer their realms. Zone K, another more well-rounded interior fortress, within which not only Phage makes its return, but also the very same cock-sucking Chameleon Stealther, 
Zone M, a single yet much more vast underground and or underwater passage, at the end of which the humpback-like battleship Great Force makes its appearance. I mean, honestly, who the hell is it supposed to be? The cybernetic version of a long-lost descendant of George and Gracie from Star Trek IV? Zone N, what do you know, another void of space, except there's a faraway planet illuminating in the background, complete with a hell ton of diamond-like craters and other threats, followed by the pteranodon-like rocket-powered crusader Megalopris. And finally, Zone O, the very last mechanical fortress, within which the Dunkleosteus makes its return like the others, followed by the end-all be-all final boss, with the other two from the end of L and N, whose descriptions I strongly suggest referring back to at this point, and all of which depend on the intermingled path you've been following, according to your path-narrowing strategies, resulting in separate endings. A massive, Terminator-like android by the name of Ghost Vic, whose confrontation is split into two phases, appearing its half of its body and its own head itself, which randomly changes its size like DC's Apache Chief, between which an escape sequence ensues, akin to Abadox, Battletoes, and Steel Empire. Just when you thought every other boss from the previous installments couldn't be any more barbarous and unhinged as fuck, what we're witnessing here definitely puts even the likes of the Great Commander from Star Fox and Green Seven Force from Gunstar Heroes to total goddamn shame, and will do way more than leave your ass in eternal, irreversible anguish with your balls caught in a fucking vice. But, yet again, as long as you're attentive enough with nailing every enemy pattern and evading every environmental threat, it should be at the very least duck soup with prime ribs seasoned in, oh, I don't know, anything with cayenne fucking pepper! Thanks entirely to the customary gameplay schematics, in conjunction with the always immaculate yet partly flawed controls, must anything more be expressed that hasn't already been done so to the end-all be-all point of goddamn repetition for the sake of piss?! Challenge-wise, in direct comparison to both Sagaya and Twin, if you're expecting any grace periods, fair shakes, or free rides out of Supernova, do yourself a noble-ass favor, go somewhere the fuck else, cause none of the above are available here at all. AT ALL! Apart from everything else, it's already enough, if not much, of a foul, festering, steaming pile of eight cancer thrusher shark shit that you're constantly forced to gather every red gem to build up the overall eight-level weapon power of your Silverhawk craft in between each unexpected as fuck death and the blue gems to evolve its force field aura despite instantaneously vanishing after a few hits regardless of the aura's current level depending on the color. Hence, as I've pointed out a while ago, when possessing both the best sight and reflexes in every tense-ass situation is key for survival. And don't get me started, goddammit, about the arbitrary, out-of-place shit that every end boss will pull when confronting their brooding asses, ditto for the often recurring mid-stage mini-boss captains, and the often and almost unpredictable minor enemy formations, all of which will flat out make you fucking regret the moment you've decided to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them if you're far from ready. And even worse still, they'll fuck your ass a million ways until Dia de los Muertos if you slip up at any given time, or unless your attack craft's weapon and shield capabilities are up to specs. Christ, talk about the understatement of the millennium, right? The usual suspenseful elements aside, there's even alternate mid-stage routes within certain zones you should be able to take, which should be at least less of a strain compared to an initially intended route whose row-based paths are varied according to the difficulty level, bottom for easy and top for hard individually. Starting up between 1 to 5 lives, with 3 being the default as before, and the returning 5 continues, Amongst many words to the wise I've advocated so far regarding just this game alone, which I can't stress enough and also urging everyone to bear in mind, keep your goddamn attack craft well protected no matter where the fuck you embark, and under absolutely no circumstances whatsoever are they to be reduced to unspeakably worthless piles of waste. While the graphics are about the same as last time, with at least a few notable changes, I suppose, there's barely any variety at all, tragic as it is to express, in terms of both the new stage backgrounds and boss designs, seeing as the former involves certain elements being recycled from others, and the latter involves a few of the same appearing in two different areas, despite some being based on dinosaurs, not just aquatic life, of course. At least there's a sufficient yet mind-blowing deal of surprisingly cutting-edge effects on the aurora-colored space voids in terms of transparency and ripples, specifically during the majority of said areas and during the end-boss confrontations, respectively. Not to mention the very same ripples apply to the underwater portions of the deep oceans and the random Mode 7 rotations during the interior mechanical fortress scenes, as well as during the boss clash against the stealther chameleon. The zoom-out transitions whenever you pick out your next planetary route are kick-ass at the very least, despite how repetitive they can all be after a while. 
Other than everything else, the three silver hotcrafts and the varying power level appropriate weapon burst they deploy are stellar as always, making even Vic Viper and Lord British, with apologies to all Gradius fans out there, look like an abandoned, broken down, decommissioned array of F 111F Aardvarks, F 117A Nighthawks, Mirage F 1s, Mikoyan MiG 29s, Sukhoi Su 25s, and Sean H 6s from the Persian Gulf War. Oh, and consider this my first, and maybe last, war-related gag in this, or any other review for that matter, ever. As far as music and sound is concerned here, arranged this time around by Kiyoshi Kusatsu, Yoshio Watanabe, and Yukiko Tanabe, this game's choice of songs possess a more heroic and intense edge to them, not to mention the more downbeat and relaxing accents, and fit every key situation more than well enough. In fact, they totally shit on those of Twin, if not by much, but are all around mesmerizing and encouraging at the same damn time, in spite of how often a few of the same themes are recycled in other zones. At least the situation-appropriate sound effects aren't much of a nerve ache this time around, including but not limited to the deep, pulsating heartbeats during the intro and title sequences, and even the monstrous groans of every end boss upon their well-deserved demises, rivaling even those in Super Metroid. And before I go any further, take note of my top 10 songs shown at the right, with a few honorable mentions displayed below. In terms of replay value, feel free to refer back to everything I've discussed so far regarding both the guy and Twin, as the majority of what's been mentioned and advised should be all the more reason to test both your wits and luck at every out of the ordinary challenge and or cosmic clash that this game will throw at you, like all the worthless, unused appliances and large heaps of rubble from an unfulfilled building or tenement, except the fucking kitchen sink of course, each chance it gets. And while we're at it, given the unfair-ass flight this game's been getting in over the one quarter of a century since it's been released, and in the same year as Super Chase HQ, no less, you'd be mercilessly stabbing yourself in the nads without end to leave Supernova, aka Darius Force, out in the cold reaches of space and beyond. Am I wrong? Am I? Cause God help your ass if you believe so. Therefore, my final verdict on the Darius franchise, it should be an instant cinch to grasp why, apart from every other well-known shmup franchise out there, this one in particular has come a long, long fucking way, and why Tyler had to manage a dramatic ass change from Space Invaders to this, thereby making yet another hit stand out from all the rest. Just as Konami did for Gradius, the already defunct compile for Olesti, Power Strike, Xanak, Gunnak, Guardian Legend, Musha, Space Mega Force, and the like, and Iron for our type. And to top it off, their traditions continued following the shift of 3D more than one quarter of a century ago, as did many other small game franchises. On a scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate all three. Even recording and posting these statistics, and notwithstanding the case-dependent flaws these games harbor, even these couldn't undermine how strongly I recommend the hell out of the 16-bit Darius games in more ways than one could possibly ponder, which I'm at no liberty whatsoever to keep elaborating over and over. Bottom fucking line, if you're starving for intense space slaughter fests, blood-boiling challenges, and the most unforgettable and headbang-worthy sounds, I'd get my ass out there and track down Sagaya, Darius Twin, and Supernova, the former and latter aka Darius 2 and Force respectively, or find them on the Cosmic Collection for the PS4, Switch, and Windows, next to the original arcade versions of the first two Darius offerings by Enon Games. Trust me, you will not regret them in the slightest, nor should there be a drop of shame in doing so. Also, please take this golden opportunity and refer to various other Darius titles on the Honorable Mentions Mantle. Until then, happy holidays and a kick-ass new year. This is the one and only Hardcore Retro Guy triumphantly signing off. So, Tiad, you wanna ditch Proko and get some dinner tonight? I always wanted a thing called tuna sauce.